Representative Evans. So moving on to Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Debbie, will you call for attendance? Director Ray? Here. Director Kelly? Here. Director President Fay? Here. Director Levesque? Here. Director Rawson? Here. Student Advisor Madeline Andrich? Student Advisor Kyle Schroeder? Here. Superintendent Sweeting? Here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Moving on, um, could we have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make a motion we approve the agenda. Second it. Thank you, it's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda. And Debbie? Director Ray? Aye. Director Kelly? Aye. President Fay? Aye. Director Levesque? Aye. Director Rawson. Aye. All right, we're here and we're ready. And I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Sweeting to talk about overview and learning targets. Good evening. Um, tonight, this is part two of our two evenings of study sessions together. Tonight, the first learning outcome that we have is to learn about the background and vision of our new Director of Equity and Student Wellbeing, Carrie Helgeson. She's going to be first on the agenda in a, in a few minutes. Then we're going to gain a new, renewed shared understanding of board roles and responsibilities as outlined in policy 1600. So it's basically just a, a quick review of our operating principles. And then we're also going to um, uh, continue our conversation about a board self-assessment goals and professional development. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. And uh, without any delay, and it's only 6.02, so we are way ahead of schedule. So. Um, Carrie, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, if you're here, I'm hoping that you're here so that you can share your, your screen. I'm here. And, and you wanna share your screen, right? Yeah. So, okay. There you go. All right. Hmm. Not sharing? No, it's not sharing the PowerPoint. Um, do you want me to oh, there. Can you see that or is it the other? Yes, yes we can see, see the PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Yes. Yep. Perfect. All right. So um, good evening, Carrie Helgeson. Uh, so Dr. Sweeting just asked me to share a little bit about myself and my beliefs and vision about equity and then kind of a game plan for rolling out the equity plan that the board adopted last spring. So starting point, of course, since this is a five-year equity plan, but our thoughts and thoughts about it right now. So before I can share about my um, beliefs and vision, I need to share a little bit about my family because I've always led from a family first viewpoint um, with my immediate family that you can see there, but also my extended family and then the family that we serve in the Arlington School District. So starting with the top, that's my husband and I, we spent some time at Zion National Park this summer hiking all around um, the park. And then uh, starting with on the right side, my sweet little darling 16 year old that uh, is a junior at Cedar Woolley High School this year. And then the, my middle one, he is 20 and he graduated also from Cedar Woolley High School if he, before COVID hit, thank goodness, because I'm not sure if he would have made it through learning in a remote computer setting. He is a go-getter and busy, busy. So, and then Zach there on the left, uh, he is 24 and he was born with Down syndrome, which came as a surprise to us at the time. 
but he is everything as you can see WWE. So that is his uh, passion and his thing right now. But really my beliefs about equity and inclusion began 24 years ago when he was born with Down syndrome, you know, and thinking about what uh, we wanted for him and what his life was going to be like. One thing that we, uh, we shared from the very beginning is that we wanted what, for Zach, what every other child has the opportunity to, to feel and to have and to explore and opportunities. So we also believe strongly that he can learn from others as just as much as others can learn from him. So getting him out into the community that he lives in as much as possible so that he has the same opportunities as any other child. Along with that, though, we've had to uh, teach Cole and Katie there how to tread those waters also with a special needs brother. So what does that look like for them and their friends? And we never wanted them to miss out on any opportunities because he, they have a special needs brother. So treading those waters has been a life journey for, for his, my husband and I. But we also didn't want Zach to be treated any differently. We wanted him to be raised as our other two have been raised. And just it takes a little bit more effort to figure out what barriers we need to remove for him so that he can be successful in whatever goal he has at the time. And he's had a number of different goals, I can tell you. When he was 16, he uh, thought that at 16, I just drive, right? He didn't understand that whole process of getting a driver's license. So we actually had to hide our keys, car keys, because we thought that he would get into the car because in his mind, he said, I'm 16, I drive. He knew that that was what happened when you turned 16. So we had to hide our car keys for, an ex for a period of time until he realized that that's not something that he's gonna be able to just jump in the car and do. And then right now he's telling us and, uh, that he is ready to move out on his own in an apartment because he knows that at you know 20 years old, he's 24, that people move out in an apartment on their own. So that is something that we're looking at doing for him. But of course, it's going to look a little different for him as it will his brother and sister when they get to the point where they're ready to move out too. So again, it's all about removing whatever barriers and putting supports into place to support each of each of them. And then um, because he has special needs, we've spent a lot of many nights down at Children's Hospital and one thing that I realized quickly being down there is that there are a lot of families that are not as fortunate as we were and had financial barriers to be able to have their child stay at Children's where sometimes, you know, families had to, the parents had to quit their jobs in order to be able to stay at Children's with um, their child. So one thing I joined quickly was the Children's Hospital Guild, which is all about removing those financial barriers for kids and raising money for uncompensated care so that no child is ever turned away for the care that they get at Children's Hospital. So a little bit about my history in education. Uh, so this is the start of my 27th year in education. Most recently, before I um, came back to Arlington as the director of equity, I was a sixth grade teacher uh, for two years in the Cedar Woolley School District. Now you're wondering, hmm, teacher, back from principal. And prior to that, I was principal for six years at Pioneer Elementary. And one thing that happened in the last couple of years of my time at Pioneer is we had some life circumstances that made me realize that family is first. I needed to focus on them and I needed to be home more. So I made that difficult decision of moving um, back to the classroom so I could be more present and on an even, every evening with my, um, with my family. So that's where that sixth grade teacher and then um, uh, that went from principal to back to the teacher and now back in Arlington because we're kind of at a different place with our family. So having a little more time to myself. But prior to working in Arlington, I was in the Mount Vernon School District for 18 years with the majority of that time being in 
the classroom, but I also uh, did some math TOSA work where I offer professional development for teachers around uh, best practices of teaching math and then um, some time with district highly capable coordinator. And then a little bit about my leadership style. I always led from relationships first. I'm, I'm a firm believer that if you don't have trusting relationships with the people you work with, that no real work can get accomplished. So that's first and foremost um, and the foundation of all work. And then um, I love the opportunities to talk with uh, staff about students and problem solving about what their needs are and how best to support them and remove those barriers. So it kind of goes back to how uh, what I've always believed and now moving into this director of equity, it's kind of just that smooth transition there. And then I love thinking outside the box about maybe something we haven't tried yet. So let's think about how else we can support the kids in the schools and not ever say, no, that's, we can't do that. And then there's my vision of equity and student well-being. Um, achieving equity requires an acknowledgement that some students just face different barriers, both in and out of school. And so how can we support them and provide different resources so that they can achieve the same educational outcomes? And then, of course, if learning cannot take place until we attend to a student's overall well-being and learning is all about the social, emotional and relationships that we happen in the schools every day. And my beliefs about equity, uh, using equitable and inclusionary practices so that each child succeeds and feels like they belong and then eliminating any racism, racial inequities, discrimination, and institutional bias will in the long run increase student achievement and graduation rates for all students. And then of course, building those relationships and providing consistency for our students, You know, having the teacher greet them at the door to tell them, oh, we are so glad you are here, just means so much to the students. So relationships again is paramount. And then strengthening those school partnerships with families. So listening to the students and having that student voice, but also the family voice about what their hopes and dreams are for their child and for themselves. And then how can we plan to achieve those goals? One thing that um, having a child with special needs taught me pretty early was there were assumptions that were made because Zach had Down syndrome that this is what his path will be. And so going in to those meetings at the schools and talking about, you know, this is when he graduates from high school, this is where we want him to be. So what backward planning do we need to make and do so that he can achieve that goal and which is what our goal was for him, that he can be an independent community member to the best of his ability. Of course, it looks different for him, but we really talked about what were our hopes and dreams for him, not were those assumptions that we made just because he has Down syndrome. So, And then the bottom one is cultivating those safe and inclusive and supporting opportunities so that all kids can be included and involved no matter what their situation is. So for example, um, Zach loved, other than WWE, he also loves basketball. So he was not able to participate on the boys' high school basketball team, but he was able to be their basketball manager. So that meant just as much to him as it does for the high school basketball team. So making sure that we're asking those questions do we have students that have always wanted to be a part of choir or band or leadership, ASB, some sport, you know, and so what, or an academic class that they want to attempt or try. So how can we make that happen and feel like they belong and part of the school? So those are just question, important questions that we need to ask and figure out. And then actions I will take to achieve this vision. So as you know, there's an equity plan that was adopted by the board last June. So we'll be looking at that in just a little bit. And then conducting that equity 
audit at the a yearly equity audit as far as assessing those opportunity gaps and using data to identify gaps in opportunity and resource and achievement and then having conversations about the strategies and interventions for eliminating those gaps and then having those ongoing data cycles so that we're constantly looking at our students and saying are they achieving to their best ability. And if they're not, then what should we be doing differently and supports that we need to put into place for them to achieve just as any other child. Okay, so now with the equity plan, there are eight goals that are in the equity plan. So I made a slide for each goal, goal one being professional learning, training and growth. So this is, talks about professional development for the staff to engage in. So here are just some examples of our plan for this year. So that's where it says year one. Carrie. So we had some Stiligwamish tribal members, you know, that came to the district day kickoff. And then they also uh, did a, an assembly at post during those back to school days. And then we have training with the since time immemorial curriculum that it was, uh, published through OSPI and Gary, we've been meeting. Gary, I think Mike had a, a question. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Pardon me. If you don't mind, just, um, I hope this is uh, appropriate. If it works in there, that's great. If you go along here and there uh, is uh, an area that uh, it, it would help me to know, like, do you think we're doing well in this area? And I know, you know, you're brand new coming back, but you've been here, like just your, your sense of like this goal one, we're doing pretty good and, mm -hmm. and we really need to make some effort here or, Hey, goal one is, you know, we're not doing very good and we got to do a lot of work just to kind of basis. Okay. I'm not holding you to anything, but if that's okay. possible. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, as you know, in education, there's always professional learning, right? There's new professional development that we're working with students and, and staff on, and there's always new rules and laws and regulations that come out through the state. But so one, um, the other thing that we're going to be doing is this, what we call multi-tier system of su support, which the acronym for that is MTSS. And the focus this year is making sure all learners, so that's that tier one, that bottom tier, but all learners are part of learning the same standard. So that's all about the gen ed classroom. So every student is a gen ed student first before they are labeled as something else. So making sure that all of our students get taught to the same standard. But then what that means is they may need a different approach, right? So that's that variability. And then how they show mastery to a standard may look different. So not expecting every student to pass that paper pencil test necessarily, but how else can they show mastery of that same standard? And then we just got signed up for uh, the deep equity cohort. So we'll have six people attending that. And that's four different Zoom sessions around how to district leaders and superintendents to move from talking about equity to implementing equity through organizational design with the systems approach. So what does the system look like to support equity in the schools? Because it's one thing to say, yes, we're doing a lot of things around equity, but really what is that systems approach to support everybody in the system on implementing some equitable practices and approaches? So and everything Carrie, here. Carrie, yeah. I was just going to mention to the board that um, Mary Levesque is joined. Mary Levesque will represent the board on that uh, deep equity cohort. Yeah. So I just wanted the board to know. And then it will be myself and Dr. Sweeting. And then we have a building principal from each level. So an elementary, middle, and high school. So having them go through that training, then it can roll out through the schools. So Carrie, all of this is, go ahead. Were you able to get a teacher uh, on that group? We have talked about it. Uh, I have not yet, but okay. we can talk more about that. Okay. But, mm -hmm. Okay. And then goal two would be to develop a diverse and inclusive curriculum. And I think this is one thing that we've done 
pretty well in Arlington. I've done it. I've been a part of a couple of different curriculum adoptions here, but that was before OSPI came out with what they called the bias screener that now we are required to uh, run every curriculum possible adoption and materials through this bias screener to make sure that they're bias free and inclusive for all learners and include multicultural perspectives. So we will continue to use that. OSPI has a pretty um, strict policy around the process to go through a curriculum adoption. And then making sure along that, that we have that diverse team on the on the adoption team. So including administrators, teachers, parents, possibly students, depending on the level of the adoption, and then making sure we're bringing all the materials that are potential um, to be adopted through the bias screener. So, and then that since time immemorial, the training around that for elementary starts uh, next week or in a couple of weeks. And that will be by somebody from OSPI to train us on how the implementation process and what that looks like actually in the classrooms. And then secondary will be at a later date. And then uh, goal three is all focused on data analysis to identify achievement and opportunity gaps. And then, uh, and then also around that, just not looking at the data, but now what do we do about that? I'm a firm believer that every thing, time we look at data, there's a story to tell and that the, we need to figure out what that story is about each student. And so this is a starting point this year. I mean, we have had professional learning communities in the Arlington School District for a long time. That part of that process is to be looking and analyzing data. But sometimes we look at that and analyze it, but then we really don't know what to do about what that story is. So having those conversations with each other and, and knowing that it's open conversations and let's try something. And that's where we have that ongoing data check is to make sure that what we're doing is working for all students and each student. And if it doesn't, then what does that student support? Does that student need to make them just be as successful? And then the equity audit, I talked a little bit about that at the beginning. Um, that's that yearly check on to assess equity needs in order to identify and implement uh, strategy supports and programs to improve academic outcomes for each child and identified subgroups. So how are our EL learners doing on reaching that same standard? What about our students that are McKinney-Vento and our students with disability? So be looking at those desegregated data on a yearly basis. And then goal four, I think this is something that we've always done well in Arlington too, is just making sure that we're hiring staff that are committed to what we believe is important here in Arlington and staff that, you know, want to, that are committed to those equitable practices and reducing barriers for our students. And right now we currently have over 700 staff members in the Arlington School District. So I thought it was around 400. So I was a little surprised with that number today when I got it. And then goal five, I think this is really something that uh, I have seen since I left uh, from being a principal to coming back is that these community teams and these uh, the collaboration, you know, with the Stiligwamish tribe, that wasn't really, I mean, we had the ACE committee at that, at the time that I was here before, but really developing these teams so that we hear all voices, you know, we hear the family voices and the student voices and community members about what they want to see happen in the Arlington School District. So I would say this, for me, coming back, this was something new that I wasn't necessarily in place as much at the time when I was a principal. So we have the district and community equity team established and we'll start those meetings, uh, first meetings next week. And then um, we have, still have the ACE committee, which has a meeting scheduled for this week. And then the ongoing partnership with the Stiligwamish tribe. So Dr. Sweeting and I meet with a few members of the Stiligwamish tribe every other week. And what we're really talking about there is not, is 
about how to make this authentic relationship and how to bring them in with that sense time immemorial to give kids those cultural connections to not just be going through the curriculum and not just having them come just for one time a year, but really build that relationship and those conversations about what our students need and how they can support us and how we can support them. And then something new that's starting that Mr. Olson is getting going through the categorical program is a connection with Everett Community College. So we are offering parents that would like to learn English and they will be coming, it'll be housed at Arlington High School in the evening. So that'll be open for any parent that wants to be part uh, participate in the language class that will probably are projected on that as winter quarter just to get things up and running and then um, learning more from families and students about what assets they bring into our schools so the administration at the high school visited nearly every ninth grade new ninth grader they made a home visit just to have those open conversations about what their worries are, what their hopes are, how can we support them coming into the high school. So that was a pretty neat undertaking that the high school administration did. Hey, Carrie, can I ask a yeah. question uh -huh. about the English class? From, yeah. a, from a non-educator perspective, does, does it matter or is it focused on what their primary language is? Is, is that, I mean, I, I gotta imagine there's some Yeah, it's learning, there, right? it's really to learn English. Understood, but like if you're yeah. like, if you have oh. uh, multiple different language speakers attending the class, does that uh, prove to be more challenging than maybe a focused language? Like maybe, you know, if it's Nope. or Russian or whatever. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I can't give a lot of information about that because this is the initial conversation we're kind of having around it. Um, and we don't know at this time how many parents are going to um, participate in that. So, but it will be an instructor from Everett Community College coming to the high school. So. And my dog is barking. Can you guys hear him? <laughs> and no, there's anybody we, home we don't to hear your dog at all. <laughs> no, don't hear him. Thank you. And, and yeah, and it's focused on helping them, you know, learn the our, the English language, but also to maneuver and leverage, you know, uh, this understanding the system and uh, being able to get the answers to questions that they have and, right. and engage. Yeah. Okay, goal six, um, pretty clear, foster a safe, inclusive, and equitable school community. So one thing that we don't always think about is what construction projects we have in place that are allowing students to have the same access, right? So the big construction projects at the high school to allow our students that are in wheelchairs to be able to access all parts of the high school. And then uh, the yearly climate and the yearly health survey that's been in place for a while and then understanding what that story is with the data telling us. And then something that I just learned about the other day was there's a co-teaching model that's been put into place this year at Post and Arlington High School where our students that are in special education or staying in the gen ed classrooms and with support from the special education department going into the classroom to support them in there. So that's really what we want to see is that all students are in the gen ed classrooms with supports from others to help them be successful in there. So that is just kind of a launch right now. And then we'll see more of that happening in, in the whole system. And then the safe schools tip line information and then that quarterly review of discipline and suspension data will be happening and I'll be having conversations with principals on a quarterly time to be really looking at um, who we're suspending and why and what those students need to be able to be successful in school.
Harry, I had a quick question for you. Yep. Um, I'm just just want to make sure it's um, I'm sure it's on your radar. But I'm just going to put it out there. Um, LGBTQ plus students. What are we doing to consider those folks in our middle and high schools? So we did start. So as um, they there are a few of those students that are part of the diversity club at the high school that are also part of the equity team. So getting their voices heard and we are starting a mentorship program that I'll just talk about it now since you asked the question that the diversity club is wanting to not only go down to post to support our middle schoolers about those cultural connections, but also our incoming, well, they're not incoming anymore. They're our current ninth graders that um, really, you know, they haven't been in school for a year and a half or full time. And now they're coming into this big comprehensive high school. So looking to support them and just having those open conversations and making sure that um, we are appreciative and aware of who each child is. So, and and do you offer anything? I, I know Weston, unfortunately, feels like the, the stepchild. I know they're not, and they're and they're very included in, in in your thoughts, I'm sure. But I'm just wondering: is there something on site for the kids at Weston, or do they need to migrate up to AHS to attend diversity club meetings and so forth? You know, that's a good question. I don't know, but I will find out about that, or if they have their own club at Weston. I will say from the interscholastic report. Um, that uh, was prep, that we provided, I think probably at maybe two meetings ago. It was stated by the principals at both uh, Arlington High School and Weston that the students at Weston can access the sports, extracurricular clubs, uh, any any of those opportunities. Uh, but there could be there's also there is a club as well at Weston. I just can't think of which one it is right now. But that'll be a good question, Carrie, mm -hmm. to ask. Yeah, for sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and then uh, respect and value diversity for goal seven. This is really focused on broadening our awareness of, and this kind of goes back to your question, Sherry, about who our Arlington students are and what assets, no matter who they are, they bring into our buildings on a daily basis. So really honoring those assets that they, um, they bring in to, into our buildings. And this is something, this is kind of a launch right now and where we can add in some different activities each year to expand our knowledge base around our different cultures. But something that uh, Carrie Henderson Burke and I are going to be doing on a monthly basis is sending out information and resources to all staff related to any holidays and, and, and observances, but not just the required holidays um, through OSPI, but also, so we sent out information around National His, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month a couple of weeks ago so that we're getting that information out into the buildings so that they can um, teach their, the, their kids about these different um, subgroups and cultural connections. So, and then as you guys know, acknowledging the ancestral lands of the Stillaguamish tribe of Indians at the first school board meeting of each month. And then the final goal here is to empower all students to achieve excellence. And this is our focus here is to, um, you know, begin asking those questions about who are we representative in our clubs and our leadership and our sports that really is reflects our demographics in Arlington. So even if um, a typical leadership student, um, let's think outside the box and about what do some other students that maybe not typically, you know, run for ASB or leadership, how can we get them involved in those leadership um, decisions there? And then uh, developing those opportunities for cross-cultural conversations for students. So I talked a little bit about the mentorship program a couple slides ago. And then thinking about, I just put a, Dr. Sweden and I met yesterday talking about that annual student summit and how we can kind of make that connection with the Stronger Together 
event that happens in the spring and how we can showcase our students at that event in some way. So it was very beginning initial thoughts around that. So, so I have one last slide, but it's a video that I wanted to show you and I'm not sure if the volume will work, but we'll see. But are there any other questions that the, any, the board has before I share the video? I had yeah. one question. Go ahead, Mary. Thank you, Judy. Hi, Carrie. This is Mary. Hi. It's so good to see your face. Oh, here. thank you. Um, We're back together again. I know. <laughs> I did, and it feels so good. So I had a question. Um, goal number four didn't really have a lot of bullet points. And I was wondering. That was, you, yeah, that's uh, that on, that's that yeah. retaining and recruiting the, and how are we reaching out to different groups mm -hmm. so to I'd, I'd be really curious to have a conversation and see where you're, what you're thinking and and how we can build that goal a little bit more yep and bringing uh eric uh -huh. de young into that conversation uh -huh. as well that'd be good thanks carrie yep carrie welcome back to arlington thank you yeah absolutely um i had a couple questions one was about um the um Professional development for its since time in Memorial Art, is that only teachers or are we going to involve paraeducators in that? Paraeducators would have the opportunity to be a part of that because it'll be on those Friday early release days. Oh, okay. And yeah. could that, is that also open to board members? Hmm. I don't have an answer, yes or no. <laughs> uh, um, and then well, I'll yeah, that's a good question. I mean, yeah. I, you know, it depends on if who's presenting, like if there's a capacity issue, but I think it's a great idea. Or and some of it might even be on Zoom. I don't know. It is all on Zoom. Is it because it's an OSPI trainer? Oh, well, that might work. So, I don't I can't see a reason why not. So we'll yeah. check check that out. All right. Yeah. And then another question, Carrie, was um um have we reached out to um any of the equity team members to be on the deep equity cohort? Um, so the two, the administrators that are on the team are in the deep equity cohort, but we're going to talk about maybe bringing a few of the staff on to get that training as well. Oh, all right. It, and it's not, it's, um, it is a commitment on the district's part. It's like $500 a person. So um, for that to participate. So, yeah. and so it isn't like we can have 10 people. So we were looking at, you know, five to six yep. each. Yeah. Um, and then I was wondering also about, um, are you thinking about a four-year plan in terms of rolling out the, the, the whole equity plan? And are you thinking about working with the equity team to roll out a four-year plan in terms of priorities and, and laying out, you know, first, second, and third thing from the plan. Yeah. So this is a five-year plan that was um, adopted, and then, yeah, for sure, this will be conversation. So I am going to next week at the equity team share the same thing I shared here as far as the goals and what we are um, thinking about having in place, and then getting their feedback as well about things that they see either could be happening out in the buildings or in the community and what we can add in to this year one. And then really talking about what is our next steps after that. So what does year two look like, right? right. Okay. And I think that goes back to uh, board member Mike Ray's question initially about what are we doing well right now in Arlington and what can we, uh, what do we really need to focus our efforts on, so. All right, thanks. And then my last question, Carrie, is um, you had talked about the co-teaching model in um, classrooms. And is that working with, our, our, is there a concentration of IEP students in one classroom so that um, that's available to have a paraeducator on a full-time basis in that classroom? Is that kind of- Not necessarily. It's about what student, what classes the students are taking and then what can how do we support them specifically in that class so there's not a full-time para in a classroom but there's but a concentration of special needs kids in one classroom 
Is that? I do not know the answer to that. Not at the secondary level. There's a, there's a few, uh, there's a few, there's one class I'm thinking of um, at one school that they may have um, the students. I don't know what you want to use the word. There might be additional students in there, but it's the intent is uh, looking at what the needs of each individual student and how that plays out in that school community. But we're not saying um, all of them are going to be in all this class. You just can't do that. That's, you know, you look at the needs and the classes that the students yeah. are taking, and then you say, what, what support do they need? And it, the goal is, I mean, the law is that they need to be in the least restrictive environment. So we, we, that's been a law since I was a special ed teacher, which is, which I started a long, long time ago. And so we just have to be mindful of that. So. Thanks, Carrie. Chris, can I talk? Okay. Um, toss in a few thoughts about that, about yes. our, our co-teaching model is, um, so it really depends on the level. So we know at Pioneer, the life skills program has been, has, has been moving into inclusive practices. Well, and it's all Carrie Helgeson's fault. She's the one that started that. So many years ago, <laughs> where, where we've seen the recent um, change and adaptation has been at the middle and high school level. So it really is dependent on um, the, as Chris said, the individual needs of the students, but we've got 24 kids in the life skills program at the high school and um, the average number of courses that the kids are out in gen ed classrooms for the life skills kids is three to four classes a day that they're, that they are out um, in the gen ed classroom and they do have para support with them, but it's not necessarily clustered because of the secondary system, right? The, the dispersal across content areas. So that's the, that's the difference between elementary and uh, secondary when it comes to inclusion for life skills kids. Yeah. Yep. Um, Carrie, I had a question. So um, on all of these goals, do you have some way you're going to be uh, measuring success or laying a baseline to kind of say where we are. I mean, I know a lot of these goals are very soft goals and you know, you're not going to have like hard, you know, numbers or stats or whatever, but have you put some considerations on kind of how you, we might measure success for this five-year program? Yeah. So I've, I have thoughts about that. Um, a, so I want to start, you know, kind of listing like I did here, but not on a PowerPoint slide, of course, about what activities or conversations are happening out in the buildings that are supporting each of these goals. And then getting, um, so today I just, for example, I just emailed uh, principals about sharing what uh, either as a building or individual classrooms are doing to celebrate the National Hispanic Heritage Month. So being able to track some of that and gather evidence in that way, because, you know, evidence isn't necessarily numbers and data. It's also about uh, actual happenings out in the buildings and talking with the students and, you know, the equity team and having conversations with principals and teachers and just seeing you know, are we doing what we say we're doing and how does that look? And so yeah. I think that's, that's great. Thank you. I, 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 I think having some kind of just descriptive, what does success look like, right? If, if, if this was going really well, here's the kinds of things that you could see have that you could go out and see. Not that we can count those things, but those are the kinds of things that we would expect to uh, see if goal eight was really successful. It's kind of that backward planning that I was talking a little bit about with you know, my, with Zach, my son about this is what I want for him when he graduates from high school. So what does that look like each year for him? So. All right. All right thank you. And, mm -hmm. and also the equity audits, they are a tool that's designed to um, assess where we are. And, and part of the plan includes the equity audits across the system. So they would provide some opportunity for evaluation and areas, I'm sure that the audit would identify for us areas that we're doing well, areas that we're not doing so well and need to, to um, make changes. I mean, I, I know we look at the LRE numbers and we go, oh my goodness, this number's really low at the high school, we need to improve it and, you know, et cetera. But I, I, I think some descriptive, what does success look like is mm -hmm. better than some just numbered stat on that, you know, we're using to, you know, uh, check a box. Right. Yeah, we don't want it to be just a check mark, right? We want it to really be alive and well in the buildings. And, right. Yeah. 
Um, so Debbie is going to share the video and this is called um, Be a Mr. Jensen. And I think this just really speaks well for I have what we from want. When I was a child. Oops, let me pause well, that for a minute. Is the depicts the mindset that we should have when it comes to putting supports in place for each student. So I like this video because it's uh, not a specific, I guess, subgroup, I guess. It's just thinking about what each student needs and what supports we can put into place for them. So I have a lot of memories from when I was a child. One that's always stuck out to me, though, was when I was about 10 years old and I was in school and I struggled. And I, I didn't struggle with English, math, or science. I struggled holding still. And I would try to listen and focus and process ideas, but I couldn't help myself. And then to be honest, I would sit there and then I would just start tapping. And the students in the class would look at me and they'd say, hey, stop tapping. A lot of the time, I didn't even realize I was doing it. And then eventually even the teachers got after me and they would yell at me and they'd say, Clint, you have to stop tapping. It got so bad that I got sent to the principal's office for tapping. And he said to me, okay, maybe when you go back to class, just try sitting on your hands. And so I did, I went back to class and when I felt myself starting to tap, I just, I did this, I sat on my hands. And that worked for about five seconds. One time I was tapping in class and my teacher, Mr. Jensen, he looked at me and he yelled. And he said, Clint, stay after class. And I thought to myself, this is it, I am done. Now I've always been the type of person that believes that a single moment in time can change a person's life. And this was one of those moments for me and I will never forget it. And so I was sitting there with Mr. Jensen and an empty classroom. And he walked past me and he sat next to his desk and he said, Clint, come here, I wanna to talk to you. And as he looked me right in the eye, he said, now, I need you to know something, you're not in trouble. But I do have just one question that I have to ask you. And he asked, he said, have you ever thought about playing the drums? And in that moment, Mr. Jensen, he leaned back and he opened the top drawer of his desk. And he reached in and he pulled out my very first pair of drumsticks. And he held them in his hands and he looked at me and he said, hey Clint, you're not a problem. I think you're a drummer. And from that moment on, I've never put those sticks down. I've toured, recorded, and played drums all over the world. My whole college education was paid for with drumsticks in my hand. Just because of a single moment in time, when somebody believed in me, and he saw something in me that I didn't even see within myself. And from that moment, I learned that there's a difference between being the best in the world and being the best for the world. Now that I'm crying. <laughs> So anyway, so I think that just, you know, represents what we want to do for each child and then removing barriers and putting supports in place for them to be successful. Carrie, thanks for sharing that. Any, any comments from the board members? Yeah. I think, I think Mary needs some tissues. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that coming. I saw it. <laughs> I have a little drummer. <laughs> yep. It is pretty spectacular and amazing how words can open doors and words can close doors. You know, a look can open a door and a look can close a door. And, you know, just uh, amazing the, the um, opportunities that we have in front of us as a system where we have people that we're nurturing. So Carrie, thank you for sharing. Any other questions or thoughts? Okay, well, we'll be engaged in more thinking and I don't know, maybe more crying too, I'm not sure, but 
we'll see what happens. Uh, inspiring. So, um, Judy, the, the next, we were going to have a break in about 10 minutes. So I'm wondering if maybe we take the break now and get ourselves together and then come back and dig in. What are your thoughts? Absolutely. Mary, I've seen this before. So I had an advantage um, and you didn't know this was coming, but yeah, it's a tough one. It's, it's not, it's tough and it's beautifully done. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, what can we get done in 10 minutes? Is that your question? Uh, either that or take the break, either that or take the five minute break now. You know, okay, and Mary, come Mary needs to throw cold water on her face. So here we go. We'll be back in what time, Chris? Well, let's say seven o'clock because it's a few minutes before seven. Okay. All right.
it's about that time. We have about one more minute before seven. Are we good, Judy? May we proceed? Okay. okay, so yesterday, last night, uh, we did some work reviewing the self-assessment results that we did um, last spring and analyzed and identified those areas of strengths uh, collectively that we um, that stood out and also the areas that need growth or have areas for improvement. So what I did is I took the feedback that was provided to develop the goals. So we're gonna, the next couple of slides, the next five slides have the new goals on them with some revision. So we'll need to um, look at them and make sure I captured the right thoughts. Um, so, and another thing I did is I, I wanted to, since there's five board goals, I kind of wanted to put them as in standards in order. So you'll see that I did some adjustments, but board goal number one is related to um, standard one, which is responsible governance. And this is what I put, I put during the 21-22 school year, board members will increase their understanding, skills, knowledge, and application of their governance roles and responsibilities by, by participating in at least two of three. So I don't know if you want to do all three this year, or one of three or two of three. So that's where you have to confirm, you know, you're, confirm with me what you're thinking of the onboarding training modules through WASDA and the evidence of progress toward this goal will be measured by the completed trainings by each board member. I mean, we talked a bit a little about this that for our, and Mark addressed this quite a bit yes, last night was, you know, to increase our capacity as a governance team. So we understand, and WASDA has done an amazing and awesome job of creating these modules for us, these onboarding modules. So did this capture, what should we change? What are some, what's some feedback here? I love that you added the training modules. I think that's great. I mean, to, to quote Kay uh, and Jeff, it's like, I wish we would have had this when we were on the board, right? So um, I think it's great. I think I think having someone, you know, go through that as a new board member, I think really lays a solid foundation for uh, governance, for being able to understand what information is being presented and to ask quality questions. Mm -hmm. So I would, I think it's good. And it's measurable in that if we say at least two of three, or even if we said three of three, or if we said one of three, whatever the board. Uh, Whoever's like going to ask them. Gina the question has to have attended the financial one. That's all. <laughs> yes. I have Gina a quick question. good questions. Yes. I, I, I just had a quick question. So when I came on board last year, my understanding was that I did do some onboarding and I went through, I guess, WASDA, it was the website. And I think I sat down with you and there was, you know, a variety of things that we kind of checked off. Was that considered one session of onboard training that's available and there's two more, or I, I just don't even know. It's, what It's I called, it's called WASDA onboard. So right. it's a adult education uh, designed research based with question and answers and worksheets and, and et cetera. Um, you know, as a new board member, we went to a WASDA webinar, right? I think Judy and I went to the same one four years ago up in, Ver up in Mount Vernon. And it okay. was, you know, here's what your job is. You know, it's about the what, not about the how and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's, that's not what we're talking about. This is formal adult education for board members. So yes. I have not received any of that. Has that ever been made available to? Uh, it's free. It's, it was free for people who demoed the courses. And then it's a couple hundred dollars for classes and they are offered at every single WASDA event. So at the upcoming WASDA events, you can look for something called onboard training. It's called onboard and right. uh, sign up and pay for whatever those classes are. Okay. And there, this is new. They've been developing these over a period of time. Uh, I remember going to a regional networking meeting and they, they were just sharing this, you know, the framework for these trainings. So they are, and they're going to keep adding to their to their bank of modules, you know, but these are the, the initial three that they have. 
So do, is it uh, appropriate for it to say two of three or um, what are your thoughts? I just, you know, um, when we make this commitment and we vote, you know, at a later board meeting to approve these goals, I want to make sure that we you know that I have the right numbers in there. And also, would that be ob obtaining this training within the, the in, within one year or over the lifetime of your time on the board within four years? Like, what is what are the parameters of? It's offered twice a year, so twice a year you have an opportunity to take two, I think, or maybe even three. I'm not sure if they if if they do them back to back. For me, they did them all back to back because I was part of the demo, so okay. they naturally didn't schedule them at the same time. So that was okay. it was it was laid out so one person could attend all three um, but I think within one year two of the three is is fine that's a that's a great that's a great that's a great up that's a great number and and like I said it's a maybe it's a stretch goal but it's a goal and it's yeah. something that's online we don't have to you don't have to attend it, it's, a, it's available it's available through a facilitated session so okay. uh, uh, the facilitated sessions are designed to be in person but over COVID, they rearranged them so they could be done uh, over uh, Zoom. But it's a little more tricky because with Zoom, you have, of course, you participate with four other people. So the adult education is with a team. And so you have to have enough people to run the class. It's not um, uh, what I would consider like a, 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 a ALE class where you're just kind of it's lap material right. you read and then you take the test it's, it's not bloodborne pathogens it's totally different than than the existing video hey, training that the, bloodborne pathogens. that the district <laughs> has right so listen listen uh, guess at the questions listen listen guess at the questions so it's More not like that it, oh, it's very interactive like i said it's it's des it's research-based designed for how adults learn and uh um, like I said, there, the training is, is you know, the WAS is developing it here. They just trying to cover their costs. But I think as they grow out more modules, they're planning to sell it, uh, or at least Tim's planning to sell it to other states. He has to, by, by law, he has to kind of give it away free for, for what they're building here for Washington. But I think he's planning to actually sell it in other states. Yeah. And um, this, these are designed, the, the goals that we're developing right now and crafting, they're an annual because so we'll check our progress towards the goals that we approve now in the fall in in January we'll we'll stop and take a pulse how how are we doing and then um, again at the end of the year take a peek at that but then next fall uh, at, assess it again do we need to keep this goal you know uh, how did we do and do we need to continue it so that's the sequence I'll put a link to the training in the chat and then you can and then you can click on it if you're in more, if you're interested. So I'll move on. I think that this is a good thing. And keep in mind it's a goal. You know, it's not like we're saying, you know, if you don't do this, you're off the board. That doesn't happen. We just it's meant to be um, a support to to all of us as a team. So this is the next goal. Um, I switched it up because I'm trying to keep these in order. So this, I want to, this is for standard two. So that follows standard one, but it used to be board goal three, but now I'm saying let's have it be board goal two. And what did I say? I didn't really change much because in the notes that I took last night or in that Debbie took that uh, what I have done here is keep it, you know, so pretty much keep it. So just make sure that it's, it says that during this school year, we're going to increase communication of a shared vision of learning and high expectations for every student, for each student. It's very clear from Carrie's presentation that that's her intent, you know, as supporting us in that, those efforts and that we'll use an equity lens to make decisions. Now, what I think this is not as easy to measure. You know, so we say evidence of progress towards this goal will be measured by communications on various formats and responses. That's not as concrete as a number, you know, so it's more observational. So if anybody has any suggestions to make it more measurable um, or if it's just fine, we'll be good. Chris, can you send those out to us tomorrow so that we can have a chance to, to spend time looking at them and give suggestions if yeah. we have any? Yeah. 
Yes. And we're the boards, you know, we're not taking any action tonight. So the next steps for, for these goals would be like uh, at a board meeting in October and maybe not the first one, but we would bring, I would bring these back for the board for formal approval. So there's time, there's time to do this. Okay. The next goal, which is, um, uh, did I go too far? Here it is. It's another adjustment. It's for the standard three, but it used to be board goal four. I just think it makes sense. Standard three, goal three. During the 2020, oops, it should change the date. So I'll note that on there. So change the date. The board will support increased public input during the budget process. So I didn't really change this one too much, except um, uh, because I know we had said we were doing well but we really didn't get a chance to do the road shows and we didn't get a chance to really do the videos. So I think we're gonna to wanna to do a take two on this, but just a thought. So that's what I, I thought. I think the other thing we, we talked about adding it, I thought it was here was um, not just talking about the um, operational budget yearly, but also our levies and bonds. Oh yeah, that's so, right. So we wanted to add something in here about you know, um, uh, a kind of a year round levy and bonds discussion, if you will, rather than it being an event, it's just kind of our standard process. Here's our, here's our operating, here's our operating budget. Here's our five year plan. And, and, oh, by the way, this is our next levy. And, and, you know, we still need post and we still need, you know, we may need another elementary school. And so it's all part of the same financial conversation rather than, um, you know, uh, you know, we just had a conversation about money and now you're back for some different money, right? No, it's, it needs to all be one money education uh, presentation. Okay, very good. I'll do that. The next goal um, was, I think I went far too far again. So this is, this one um, what is for standard four and we have two goals for standard four and this, so I just changed it. It used to be board goal two, but what I put is that we will uh, review on a regular basis and that's why it says uh, at least two. And I think there's another parentheses mark that needs to be there, but I changed this up. There was recommendations last night that we focus on the board's role, not the how. So what I said is we'll review results of student achievement and performance, including disaggregated data, in order to monitor, adjust, and make decisions to meet student learning expectations. I guess there's a comma missing resources and close a opportunity gaps. I tried to focus this more on the results, Mark. I, 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 I really like that. I really like that. I mean, let's say not that the how isn't interesting. It's just it needs to be bracketed with student outcomes, right? Student outcomes is what is the board's purview. And so if we're going to talk about a how, that's great, but it's, it can't be a how in a vacuum. It has to be a, a how, and it, this how resulted in this student outcome or that student outcome. We also have our dashboards, right? So our student dashboards that are out there, ninth grade on track, all of that stuff. So when we say including disaggregated data, I, I assume we're talking about our, our goal tracker that, that is, that's, on our, that's on our website. Um, yeah, it also means disaggregating it by different uh, population or student groups, like um, how are our students uh, of color doing in math? How are our students McKinney-Vento who are homeless? So it's when you talk about disaggregated data, it's, it's even getting to a deeper level of that. But the data dashboard has that disaggregated data and the OSPI report card has the disaggregated data. But we as the board need to take time to do a data dive and to look right. into that. Well, of course, I, I don't think we've ever, at least in the four years I've been here, gone out to the OSPI uh, school website, right? I mean, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but never as a group have we said, okay, let's just go out to the public available website where all of our constituents can go and pull up Arlington and look to see how it compares with all of the other schools. But all the data is out there. It's all the OSPI public, they call it the school school, uh, uh, you know, uh, report card, school report card site. Um, and it's all out there. So there's that site, there's our existing internal under community under district dashboard site. 
And so, again, I'd, I'd like us to be able to maybe at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, take a look at kind of how have we done on student outcomes? How have we, you know, it, um, uh, been doing that? And I think while the, the you know, us five answering a self report card about how well our ideas are matched, are matched, that's great to show that one of us thought nothing and one of us thought everything. So there's obviously a disconnect between the five of us. I would much rather have something that, you know, like I said, those those 60 plus questions rather than being answered by the five of us, I like those 60 questions asked by the community to say, how do they think we're doing? And so if we as a group can go out to the websites, go through the dashboards and take an honest look to say, okay, well, here's how Stanwood's doing. Here's how Lake Stevens is doing. Here's how we're doing, right? Um, uh, I think it would be a, a worthwhile exercise to look at and focus on student outcomes rather than here's a bill, here's a SIP, right? Now, SIPs are great. SIPs don't have outcomes day one. When you start the SIP, you don't have, you can't show your results. So, you know, rather than in previous years where all the SIPs came through and said, here's all the SIPs and, and et cetera, if the SIP can be tied to student outcomes, fabulous. Show us the SIP, show us the outcome. But if there's no outcome, like I said, it's interesting. I'm not saying it's not great information. It's just unactionable for the board. It's a how you're doing something. And um, it's like, okay, so did this help or did this not help? We don't know yet. This is what our plan is. Our plan is to do this as an improvement or do that as an improvement. Again, great information. And maybe we have a study session where we just look at the SIPs if we're interested. But I would I would prefer to focus our shared time together on student outcomes, which is that's our purview. Yeah. And I put um, as evidence, change the wording. I said evidence of progress will be measured by board agendas, meetings and minutes, because that's our that's our artifact that include data dives. We can put that a little bit differently and results or student outcome focused conversations. So somehow, you know, some artifacts that show that we engaged in that in that work. You already sort this. As a matter of fact, well, Julie was doing it. I'm not sure whether Debbie's doing it, but every single item got tagged to one of our goals. So you can just go into board docs and sort every single item by how many did we have for goal one? How many did we have for goal two? How many did we have for goal three? Board docs just sorts all of your agenda items by goal. That's true. That's true. All right. Any other thoughts? We'll go on to board goal five. And guess what? I didn't have to cross out anything. I did change the wording here. Um, I said that during this school year, each board member will participate in at least two listening opportunities, such as community voices, student voices, or staff voices, for the purpose of to foster the engagement of and the promotion of our students and staff and community providing feedback to us in order to make better decisions. In other words, this has to be a measurable goal, goal of what we're going to do, but what's the result for? And, and the goal, this area is engaging our community. So we have these voices opportunities, but for you to engage with the public and them to engage with you, you know, we're saying that you would participate in at least two. Now, I hope you do more than that, but at least two, you know, opportunities. So I don't know. Um, the evidence of progress toward this goal will be measured by attendance at the voices, opportunities, and feedback and comments received, basically. So that's what I gathered in, um, from last night, and I think that was good work. I think that, that what I appreciate is that we are building these goals on um, authentic, um, I guess, really the, the self-assessment, but also uh, founded in our, our strategic plan goals. What is it that we really need to accomplish and said we are going to accomplish? And what is the actions of the board that's within their role, you know, staying within that role that they will do to promote in those areas? So I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a good alignment. There's coherence in this work. So are we good to move forward or is uh, other thoughts? Because the next step is professional development. So if those are our goal areas, 
And we already have, I mean, we can say right now what one of those areas is going to be because it's our goal one, saying that we're going to do two, at least two of the three um, onboarding. But um, so the, the purpose of the professional development is the reason why something exists or is done or used to aim or intention of something. So the purpose of the professional development is help us to, um, to move towards something. And we have five goals that we, and we've identified those goals to support not only the work that we do as a governance board, but the work at the whole district, because each one of those goals is aligned to a strategic plan goal. So that's the purpose. So we need to create a plan. Um, we've done this each year, but I hope it's more intentional this year. And I think we already have some intentionality with that board goal one, but we consider the board goals when we create our professional development plan, we consider our collective board self-assessment results and we consider our own individual because there'll be some, like when we go, some of you will do it virtually, but when you attend the WASDA fall conference, you'll have an opportunity to select breakout sessions. And when you select those breakout sessions, maybe it's because you have an individual area within that assessment or that you've identified that you need to, to know more, you know, as a board member. So in the past, when we've done this work, we've, you know, there's, there's identifying those areas of growth. And I think we have the one, the two of the three onboarding areas that we're going to engage in learning each of us. But there's also topics or areas that we want to know more about so that we can govern better, so we can lead better, and that we are better informed. And so last year, we took some time, everybody kind of listed some topics. And some of the topics that we engaged in learning last year uh, was universal design for learning. Um, and equity and cell, which is social emotional learning. And I'll have to say that we were captured a lot by COVID. So there, a lot of our moments too had to do with how we would engage our students in instruction. And, and so, but within that there was the equity. So what I'd like you to do right now is to take five minutes uh, in individually and think of one to two topics that you believe the board should study or learn more about to support the board goals or areas identified by the board self-assessment. But keeping in mind that this is to support the work that, that we do as a, a governing body and um, to support the um, strategic plan goals that we have. And then as you're thinking of those topics, then identify a rationale or connection for each topic. So in other words, if you say, I want to know more about um, special education, because um, I believe that there's some work that needs to be done there. And I don't understand how we're supporting this, the students with special needs to grow more in reading or to have increased learning and reading, something like that. So it connects to a strategic goal or uh, connects to a standard. So take five minutes. Thank you.
We have about two and a half minutes left. One minute. Okay, we're going to uh, take time now for each of the board members to share your topics um, and the rationale or the connection that you found. And then um, I'm going to take some notes. Debbie will take some notes and we'll try to find some common topics that are identified. And then um, after we do that, we'll talk about opportunities for learning um, that maybe could, where the topics can be um, talked about and learned about. Who would like to go first? Oh, I could be the guinea pig. Um, yeah, I just feel like there's so many areas and I'm really gonna miss Mark because he's so articulate and makes me sad. <laughs> um, one area that I would um, like to, a topic I would say is for the board to have a clear understanding of both financing um, for our school programs and facilities so that we can best communicate with our community and constituents when we explain our prudence with funding for those programs, buildings, et cetera. So I am, that is definitely a, I don't want to say a shortcoming on my part, but not an area of strength for me to understand. I mean, I can conceptualize, but I don't always understand the nuts and bolts. Gina does her most excellent way of explaining to the layman what the numbers we have in the district and what that looks like. And she really makes it very clear for us to understand. Um, but that is an area that, um, I figure if I can be more on board with understanding what those numbers mean, then I can better articulate it to people in my elevator speech saying, you know, this is what we're spending. This is why we're spending and, you know, understand what a, um, I forget what the word Gina uses, but, you know, just money in the coffers, money that's set aside, you know, using those, that lingo. But then um, as I, as I come to understand it more clearly, then I can, communicate it more effectively to our community. Um, but if I'm kind of in the dark and I'm uncomfortable, then I'm probably going to be um, more reserved in my conversations. But I feel like that's definitely a conversation when we're asking for money, we're asking for votes. Um, we have to be comfortable with money. We have to be comfortable with, with what those numbers mean. Um, so that's, that's one area for me. Um, the other part, and this is something I'm trying to begin to undertake is just, understanding our relationship with the legislature 
I know we have WASDA. I know we communicate our our goals. We work together as as WASDA to then um, work identify those goals, narrow those down, and then communicate with the legislature. Work work in tandem with them to to get some of those um, those goals achieved. Um, but I would I would I just want to understand a little bit more on um, you know how do we how do we take that big scope of the state and then apply it to our individual goals like equity. So if, if our intention as a district is to apply more equity and um, you know, everything that, that Carrie was talking about tonight have, if that's a, a very, that's a big part, if it's a newer part, then um, you know, how is that best communicated to the legislature? Again, this is something that each of our, each of us as a board member can be um just comfortable as a talking point so that when we're sharing ideas with the community or there's questions that come up in a board meeting, um, we, we have an understanding of saying we're looking to meet these goals and then we're going to our legislature to have funding for these, you know, more mental health counselors. That's a key. So how do we do that? And then we have someone like Mark and that's, and he provides, Mark has done an excellent job at being very succinct and clear um, with his meetings and, and, and always kind of like, what was the takeaway? What did he come back with? Um, so those are just some of my personal areas and, um, Robert's rules of order. <laughs> I would love a class on that. I surprisingly, I first learned about that with Waldorf teacher training and, um, it was brand new to me. I didn't know that sort of thing existed. So I, again, if Brian has a, if Brian could do a little YouTube on that, that would be great. Um, but I think that would be, that would be something I would like to know more about. Thanks Sherry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, other thoughts? Sorry, I'm gonna piggyback on you um, because the area that I found um, that we needed when we did our, our own private board assessment, the area that we came out lowest in was um, number 15, which was collaborate with colleagues across the region, state or nation um, regarding current and emerging trends, issues and policy solutions. And we rated ourselves pretty low in that area. Um, so I think that that would tie in with what you're talking about in terms of um, getting ourselves involved with bigger and broader conversations. Um, I was involved with a conversation with um, about, well, 10 to 12 different school districts um, right in our area, um, Marysville, Lakewood, um, Cedar Hall, um, recently. Um, with board presidents reaching out to each other, um, um, discussing what's going on with um, meetings and agendas and how are we handling it and Zooming it or in person. And that was the first time that I had really spent a large part of time emailing um, with other board members. And it was wonderful. And the 10 or so of us that were involved in it um, all said that we need to do more of this. Um, not just when we're in crisis, um, but but all the time. So I think that that would be a, a goal that um, that I would totally agree with you on, Sherry. That that we could um, do more of that. And then the other area that that I found in our board in our personal board assessments um, that wasn't just this year. This year, in terms of an area that we needed that we felt we needed help with, but it's consistently been the the past four years is the student achievement. Um, and, and those were um, area number 59 through 62. Um, and I think part of that is understanding for ourselves um, the criteria and assessment tools and methods that are used. And, um, and I think that's come up this year, you know, in ter and last year in terms of um, talking about what's best. Are we talking about star? Are we talking about I ready? What's effective? Um, what's too much? What's not enough? So I think something around um, building our our understanding and and then not only will we understand the effective use of data to monitor and improve student achievement, but we'll be able to get those data points so that we can really look at them uh, much like what Mark was talking about. Let's look at the data. But we can't really look at that data unless we really understand what tools um, we're using um, to assess that data. And are those the best tools? Is that what we want to be using? Is there a better way? Is formative, you know, 
we've spent a lot of time talking about formative versus um, other kinds of, of assessments, standardized assessments. So I'm not sure what I'm saying this goal is. I haven't really worked it out in my mind um, in a nice con um, sentence, but around the criteria and assessment tools and methods. And, and then as a final goal, you know, we're going to look at adjusting those resources and strategies for closing achievement gaps. And that's all part of, of what we're trying to do. So that's real vague and I don't know how to put it, but if I have some time, I can get you and try and get it into a more concise statement. So Thank those are two that I'm thinking about. Yeah, well, for example, Judy, you had mentioned, you know, adjusting resources for closing achievement gaps and opportunity gaps. You know, there there's um, opportunity, I believe, at the WASDA conference coming up for breakout sessions to learn what other districts are doing in that area. So it's, it, you identify that area, and then we intentionally go find connections like you you know you made a great praise of connections and so no thank you for sharing those areas appreciate it okay who else so i'm not sure if i understood the assignment correctly but i did come up with something i don't know exactly what topic it would fall under um but i believe that gen ed teachers need more professional development training on working with special uh, special needs children. Um, especially I've just observed from me being in classes with special needs children that they aren't getting as much involved material as we are, which obviously they can't because their mind doesn't work that way. But at the same time, I have noticed them not being as um, involved in a way, and it's not specifically one teacher. And I think that might just be lack of training um, in that and how gen ed teachers are supposed to incorporate them in normal activities. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. So Maddie, one of the things I think I hear is that you, so as a board, I mean, you described the professional development of what a teacher might need, but as a board, we might want to have understanding um, about um, the different ways that we, different programs, um, just informational ways uh, of ideas and things that we're doing to meet the needs of our students that are identified with special needs. And so yeah. that could be as a board, we could learn more um, for the purpose of being able to make decisions about programs when we have a curriculum that comes to us as a board to adopt or consider or a policy that has some practices that we're incorporating or some concepts. So thank you, Maddie, for sharing that. Yeah, of course. Who else? So, um, well, I don't have any of the specific uh, line items on oh, my screen is really dark. Um, on there, as scrolling through them all, I would collectively clump the areas that I would like to learn more about is anything out of Mrs. HB's office and <laughs> anything out of, um, you know, uh, the special needs and equity office. I forget that is escaping me what um, that is called right now. I apologize, but that office as well. So anything out of there is uh, where I need to focus uh, some learning. I feel always uh, like I'm playing catch up on those. Okay, that sounds good, Mike. I appreciate that. And um, I, I wrote those down. I put down the teaching and learning, which is Carrie Henderson Burke. So teaching and learning mm -hmm. and special education and the equity and student well-being office. Yeah. And those look like ones that we're collectively score rather lower on, like not as much green, just in glancing through, but it was hard to hard to cherry pick a few ones there. Okay, thank you. Who else? Hi, it's Mary. I Hi, have Mary. I have two topics that are near and dear to my heart, and I don't know if they're like a group goal or anything that I don't know how to articulate what's in my heart, but I am I'm worried and concerned about the special ed kids. So pretty much everything you said in your example, that would be great um, for special ed and just knowing what programs we have. 
Like a lot of people in the community don't know how to access special education. They're worried about their kids maybe needing extra help, but they don't know what to do. What's the next step? How do they access resources? What do we have available for them? What programs do we have in which buildings for which, um, which needs and, and how much funds are needed? And do we have the right balance and do we have the right funding um, for everything that, that we need? And, and, and how is our progress for all of those things? And then another thing that, um, that I'm really worried about this year, and, and it was mentioned a lot last night, and that was the, the social and emotional learning and the mental health needs of our community. They're very, very great. And then maybe just kind of more information about what we're doing on those levels, um, where, the, where the gaps are, what programs we have available, if there's funding that needs to happen for, for more help for that, um, for more time for professional development or more resources or more grants that are written for more um, licensed professionals to help our kids or more surveys or just, you know, what, what, what do we have? What do we not have? What do we need? Um, how we're doing with, with mental health and, and social emotional learning. So th those are the two topics that are close to my heart and, and what keep me up at night. So I'm not sure how that would be a board goal though. So I don't, I don't not, know. And these aren't really goals. These are just topics to study. So you're okay with what you've described, but they should support a, a board goal or a strategic plan goal. And you know, when we're talking about understanding and knowing the programs that we have available for students who have special needs, we're talking about student achievement. That's goal number one. How do we increase student learning and achievement when a student may need accommodations or when students may need specially designed instruction? You know, so what are we doing in those cases? So thank you. But um I think we're Mark. I guess, I haven't heard from you. Uh, 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 well, that's because um, I waited until I've been talking a lot. So Elizabeth said, <laughs> "Be a listener." So I'm trying to <laughs> channel that. Um, so uh, the one thing that uh, uh, people haven't mentioned, um, and I won't, I won't be here to participate in that. But at some point, uh, our fearless leader will move on, and one of the most important things that this board will do is hire a new superintendent. I went out to the WASA site, which is like WASDA for the school boards, WASA is for the superintendents. Uh, on their current site, they had 37 open positions out of 295. Now I'll bite, probably some of them are closed. I saw Eric's position out there for LaConnor and Stanwood's position and Mount Vernon's position, et cetera. So it's not like it's current. My point is, is at any one time, you're gonna be competing with over 40 other districts in the state to hire a quality superintendent, all right? And so I think this board needs to go to training, talk to consultants, talk to other school districts that have had success and start right now figuring out how you do a great job at your number one thing you are accountable to do, which is hiring a, a great superintendent, right? Our bar is set really high, all right? So it's going to be really difficult. Um, but I truly think that that's the most important thing this board can be spending their time on is making sure they make a great decision uh, associated with uh, the, uh, the new uh, superintendent at the point that we need a new one. So that would be my one study goal for, for the board. Thanks, Mark. That's, um, uh, Mark thanks for bringing that up. Um, I think Mark and I both took um, a, a training class on that at WASH at WASDA one of the years. And it's a great, great course on how to find a new superintendent. Um, and I highly recommend it for um, everybody to, to use that available training um, in October or November. When, when WASDA? No, November. November, yeah, it'd be an excellent opportunity um, to, for everyone to do that as one of the breakout sessions. Yeah. Very, very informative. And, you know, there's plenty of uh, runway space for when that time happens, but just understanding um, 
uh, just what do you be, need to be prepared for? Because it is a long process, you know, and it can be done uh, uh, better and well if people are engaged and, and informed. So I plan to come to every public meeting, just so well, you know. Very you'll good. hear from me. At, I, I told Dr. Sweetie, you'll hear from me for three minutes at every meeting. Well, so that's you won't that's miss me. Good. That's very good. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> counting on it. So now you've said it public and it's recorded. So yes, and I can talk about anything I want. So uh, who, who knows what we'll be covering during my three minute uh, spiel? Well, we'll be listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see is Kyle on? I'm not I think I saw him earlier. Kyle? I'm here. Uh, the thing that I have down, uh, like Miss Faye talked about earlier, uh, uh, collaborating and understanding what our neighboring districts are doing. Uh, but more specifically, um, obviously we were ha having an online uh, school year last year and we're still seeing some of that this year with online um, board meetings, obviously. So I just wanted to see uh, if it was possible to understand what our neighboring districts are doing in order to bounce back from that and get back into the flow of a normal and in-person year. I feel like it would be really great to see if we are uh, on par with what's going on around us. That's a great, great topic, Kyle. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Can I add one more thing? Yes. I'm sorry. I, but Mark made me think of it. Um, Talking about a long-term transition that's in the future, I think we also have a very short-term transition that's in our very near future um, with new board members coming on board. And I, I just really want us to, to do a good job welcoming and training and, and getting them up to speed as, as quickly as they can and, and um, being as cohesive as possible. So um, whatever ways we can identify to make that a more smooth transition that would be really, really great. No, oh, good point, Mary. And we have uh, at least reserved the space for the positions on the board. So that would include the new members that would be um, um, taking the place of Mark and, and Judy. And because um, we know that they did not choose to be reelected this time. So, and then I know Sherry's, um, there's someone that we just don't know how that'll play out, but we, we're we prepared to have those, the board, the board to go to training um, at WASDA and they'll get some good onboarding there. Okay, so I want to, so the, I just, the next slide just talks about, so these are things that we wanna learn more about and to study to help us um, meet the goals that we've set and to, and to be a, a governing body um, that really makes a difference for each student. We have board study sessions like last night and tonight. There are several throughout the year. So those are opportunities for us to take some of the topics that, that are there. And I the, one of the common topics that I heard was special education or how do we support students that have uh, different needs. You know, it could even be title and lap. It could be 504. It could be those things too. But we have board study sessions. We have the WASDA and other conferences and regional meetings and networking Thursday webinars and book studies. So those are opportunities. Um, before we go on to the operating principles, we've got about um, 10, 10, 10 minutes, which I think I can do this, the 1600 in, in that time, because we're just going to do a quick review anyway. I wanted to know on the professional development, uh, if, if I kind of, I'll type up the, the topics and I'll, I'll send them out to you just so you can review the topics. And then um, we can kind of engage in, I'll, I'll engage in conversations with you about, you know, what would we want to learn more about first? And it sounds like special education is, cause that came up more often for sure, but I'll, I'll type it up and, and see what we can do. And for example, Sherry, you're, you had listed um, relationship with the legislature. There's some of these, there's automatic ways to learn. So there's a legislative conference that comes up, you know, where you can make connection with um, the legislators during that time. But there's other opportunities as well. So 
it's almost like these are the topics, but we can kind of craft and map out a, a, a design or a implementation a plan for this. So I'll, I'll make an attempt at that and share it with the board and see if it, what, where we go from there. All right, so in wrapping up the, the, this study session, just bringing back the board and superintendent operating principles policy 1600, we've worked on this quite a bit over the last several years, we've revised it at times, but tonight's just a quick review. So the next slide is a slide that actually was shared with us by Patty Wood. And you remember Patty is a consultant from WASDA, but she also um, has been, she's on the State Board of Education and she got reelected. So she's there again. And she was on, I think the Kelso School Board, but she um, presented this to us, just reminding us because in policy 1600, it, it begins by outlining what is the, the role, what are the roles and the functions of the board? And then what are the roles and function of a superintendent? And how do we work together to be an effective team for one purpose, increase student learning and achievement, our goal number one. So at the top is the board domain, the governance domain. So there's evaluations of product reports, there's goals, there's policy plans. And then beneath the um, cloud, she has the the how or the process reports and the operations and procedures. And sometimes this all, there are moments when things blend together, um, but we, we're more effective if we stay within our, um, our functions. This chart is easier. This is in the, the policy 1600. Um, it is there, it just talks about that the school board governs, it guides and it directs, it decides the what, the superintendent decides the how. It doesn't, I would never as your superintendent do it in isolation because I would want you to, and just like Mark said, it's curious and interesting to know about the how, but the board will want to know what and, and the results. Because as you look down, um, the board is in the govern, governing role. They um, request information, which you do a wonderful job in doing that, and um, consider the issues. We've had to do that with the reopening schools and just moving from step to step, um, create, review, adopt policy, approve and review plans. You do that almost every board meeting. You monitor progress. You have an opportunity several times during the year, um, at least three formal times with the strategic plan, there's a review. And then you also uh, do this with the SIP uh, plans in the round tables. Um, you con you um, contracts with personnel and you approve the evaluation criteria criteria and procedures, you approve and read the, review the budget, and you represent public interest. I was, last night, one of you said that you would hope that we could, you know, with, with each director district, there's people in that district, you know, that group. And so you wanna talk about what are their interests? And you, you do, you are elected by as a, for the whole district, but you represent a certain um, district within our district. So decides the how, that's the superintendent seeking and providing information. I provide you with recommendations and um, recommend and implement policy. And I do uh, create the procedures along, well, the team and myself, we create the procedures. So you can see this long list. So this is just a review. Now, the next couple slides, I'm gonna go really quickly because you've had in your board packet, the policy 1600, and because the next one just kind of shares it very, you can't even read it, but it's time for a quiz. So I think you are experts on this. So we're gonna end the night with a quick quiz. So you are going to, on something in front of you, number down to one to 12. And this is true or false. So I'm gonna read a statement and I need you to put down whether the statement is true or whether it is false. And this is all has to do with the policy 1600 and many of the things we just talked about and some of the things we did within that policy. So are you ready? Ready. 
Okay. All right. Mark's ready. Everybody, I see Kyle's ready too. Okay. Number one, the board monitors progress. True or false? The board monitors progress. Number two, the superintendent implements plans. Number two, the superintendent implements plans. Number three, the it's board. It's open book, right? What? I can't tell if you're looking at your book, Mike, I guess. <laughs> I, you know book. what? You use whatever resources you need to, to do the answers, but you might want to check yourself and see what you know without checking the book, but you can look at the book if you need to. Um, the, where was I? Let's see. Number three. three, the board decides how. The board decides the how. Number four, the superintendent provides, number four, the superintendent provides recommendations. Number five, it is important to work together as a team. Number five, it's important to work together as a team. Number six, the board gives direction to the superintendent as a total board. The board gives direction to the superintendent as a total board. Number seven, the board and superintendent work to maximize misunderstandings. Number seven, the board and superintendent work to maximize misunderstandings. Number eight, the board and superintendent reduce conflict by focusing our discussions on issues, not personalities. That's number eight. The board and superintendent reduce conflict by focusing our conversations on issues, not personalities. Number nine, the board reviews, modifies, and adopts policy. Number nine, the board reviews, modifies, and adopts policy. Number 10, both the superintendent and board commit to lots of surprises at meetings. So number 10, both the superintendent and board commit to lots of surprises at meetings. Number 11, the board supervises two employees, the superintendent and finance officer. Number 11, the board supervises two employees, the superintendent and financial officer. And the last one, number 12, the board governs and the superintendent leads and manages. The number 12, the board governs and the superintendent leads and manages. Okay, gonna get 100% on this, right? Should be pretty easy. Okay, number one, I, I, I need you to shout out. So unmute all of you and we just want, so what's the answer to number one? True. true. That's correct, true. The board monitors progress. Number two, the superintendent implements plans. True. That's correct. True. Number three, the board decides the how. False. False. That's false. Very good. Number four, the superintendent provides recommendations. True. True. That's number six, the board gives direction to the superintendent as a total board. True. 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 Thank you. That's true. Three to five. <laughs> It's an, it's an interesting challenge, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. Number eight, the board and the superintendent reduce conflict by focusing our discussions on issues, not personalities. True. True. Yep. But did yep. you skip through seven? You skipped seven. Oh, I did. Sorry. She, she didn't do seven. Did you? Did you no, no. 
What? Well, okay. Num no, number seven is the board and superintendent work to maximize misunderstandings. Yeah, that's false. False. Let's see. Yeah. Hopefully we don't do that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awful. Okay, nine. The board reviews, modifies, eight. and adopts. Eight. We got eight already. It was true. Eight, eight was true. true. Get on board. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Wait, let's help each other here. Okay, so nine. nine. Board, the board reviews, modifies, and adopts policy. True. 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 Number 10. Both the superintendent and board commit to lots of surprises at meetings. False. False. Oh. False. Okay. I like some surprise. No, I don't think. <laughs> 11. The board supervises two employees, the superintendent and finance officer. False. 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 Do you know what you like that? <laughs> okay. And, and, what I was <laughs> and then 12. The board governs and the superintendent leads and manages. True. 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 I think you all are experts on that. So. We're going to wrap up the night, at least my part, and then uh, you can do your part. But the board goals will be refined and presented to the board for final approval later in October. But you'll see it before then, you know, it won't just come then. And uh, the board PD plan will be more formalized and, and you know, implemented in the places that we can. And um, from last night's presentation, the emphasis that I shared was that we're going to keep moving forward. And we're going to do it intentionally. We're going to do it caring for one another and um, do it well. So that takes us to, whoops, this slide. Come on, Judy. Back to you. <laughs> Get that gavel. <laughs> what? Judy, but you have to unmute, Judy. The move we adjourn. Thank you. And I second that. Thank you. Motioned and seconded to adjourn. Madam Secretary, please call for attendees. Director Ray. Aye. Director Kelly. Aye. President Fay. Aye. Director Levesque. Aye. Director Rawson. Aye. We are adjourned. Good night. Good night. Good night.